So uh, we're here to talk about ap application security, making it easy when you're building applications. Um, my name is Les Hazel. I'm the PMC chair for Apache Shiro. Uh, Shiro is a, an Apache top-level project <coughs> that focuses on just uh, application security within the Java virtual machine. Um, it's agnostic as to the framework or, langu or uh, JVM-based languages that you would want to use. So we have people that use this with JRuby applications and Java applications, Scala, it doesn't matter. <coughs> Excuse me, anything on the JVM is fine. Um, I work for Stormpath. We're an identity management API uh, hosted as a, as a cloud service. And um, we focus on securing applications, providing it kind of out-of-the-box workflows, um, integration with identity stores, keeping that very simple. Um, Stormpath as a security service is itself secured by Apache Shiro. So uh, we rely on it heavily to keep our server secure um, in addition to uh, um, keeping general applications secure. So secure is, or excuse me, Shiro's seen quite a bit of growth. I need to update this slide. Um, it's, uh, it's actually a much steeper curve now. Um, we've seen quite a bit of growth in the last year and a half. Um, and I think last time we did some market research, there was at, at least 100,000 applications in production based using Shiro. Um, many government and uh, banking applications use it quite a bit too. <clears throat> um, it's used pretty heavily in um, Bank of America, NASDAQ, um, US DOD, uh, the various um, intelligence agencies, they all, they all use Shiro in a lot of their applications. I'm sorry? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. So we, uh, we definitely have quite a bit of those guys, a lot of banking too. So this is what we're going to talk about today. Shiro is, focuses on what we call the, the, the Shiro team kind of calls the four cornerstones of application security. There's authentication, which is proving you are who you say you are. Authorization, otherwise known as access control. Session management, <clears throat> so stateful or lifecycle state uh, with, associated with users. And cryptography and keeping data secure. And around these four cornerstones, we also have some additional web support for uh, web applications, servlet container applications, and there's some auxiliary features that I'll try to get to um, for multi-threading and testing and whatnot. So before we dig in too deep, I want to cover some quick terminology that Shiro uses <coughs> excuse me, in, in the API. Uh, the first is that of a subject. And the subject is nothing more than a security-specific um, view of a user. And so it, it only contains the, or it only represents the things that are security related for a given identity. Uh, but that identity, the reason why it's called subject and not the word user is the word user is often, um, there's often connotations associated with human beings with the word user. But Shiro doesn't need the end user to be a human. It could be a process, it could be a daemon, it could be a third party server. So the, su the word subject just means the thing that's currently interacting with the software, the identity that's currently interacting with the software. We have this notion of principles, and principles for us are just a collection of identifying attributes. So first name, last name, social security number, unique primary key. They're just things that identify the subject. Credentials then are things that are paired with identity that verify um, those identities. So secret key values, um, private keys, passwords, these are all credentials. And finally, we'll talk a little bit about realms. And a realm in Shiro is Essentially a security specific DAO. Everybody here familiar with the data access object design pattern? So it's just the bridge between Shiro and a data store that contains identity information. So you might see an, an, a JDBC realm that talks to a database over JDBC or an Active Directory realm or an LDAP realm. Or, um, again, they're just the, 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 the middleman between a data store and Shiro's functionality. Okay, so we'll start off with authentication. And authentication is, as we define it, it's identity verification. It's proving that a user is who they say they are. So actually verifying their identity via some credentials mechanism. And Shiro offers as part of its kind of authentication feature set um, a subject-based API. So you can obtain the currently executing user. Then you perform authentication by invoking a method on the subject. It's just a single method. It's nothing complex or scary or <clears throat> confusing. If anything goes wrong, 
there's a very nice exception hierarchy kind of that's built in out of the box that you can extend for your own needs that tell you exactly why the authentication attempt failed. Uh, Remember Me is also built into the framework. So for a web application, <coughs> excuse me, if, uh, if users want you to remember their identity, uh, th then we can uh, retain that state in a cookie, typically. And of course, there's event listeners. So you can listen for authentication events, whether an authentication succeeds or fails, you can react to these and plug in hooks into your application to, to react to these events. So how do, you, how do you do authentication? Very simple, there's three steps involved. You have to collect cr pr principles and credentials, identifying information and some sort of credentials that verify that identi identi identity from the user in some way. And unlike JAS, J-A-A-S, Shiro does not impose <coughs> any kind of um, hook into the login procedure. So you can collect the information however you wish whether it's a username and password from a form submission or a private or um, excuse me a public key versus uh, versus PGP key you can do this you can collect this info however you want HTTP sockets it doesn't matter um, you just collect the information and you bundle it up and then you submit it to Shiro and Shiro verifies that information and then returns a status or a success back to you so here's how this looks in this case we're going to use the very simple username and password use case which Easily covers the 80-20 rule. Most people use username and password based systems, at least when they're building apps. So the idea is that we'll, we'll take the username and password, we'll bundle it up into a token. And this is called an authentication token. Uh, and in this case, we're setting remember me to true. <clears throat> so we want the, the user's identity to be remembered across sessions. And then we need to obtain the currently executing subject. And again, this is a subject concept. It, could, it doesn't have to be a human, but in this case, we're giving this, this uh, instance variable name kind of, uh, or just variable name, current user, as like a, a re, a, an alias for readability. So if I want to log in the current user, I just submit the token that I created to the current user, and that's it. If it succeeds, then your program goes on operating. You know, the very next couple lines of code execute immediately. The user is considered authenticated at that time. And you can do all sorts of other things that we'll get to later for authentic authorization. But if it fails, you can catch all sorts of different exceptions that tell you why it failed. So there's an unknown account exception. Maybe their password was incorrect. There's an incorrect, incorrect credentials exception. Maybe the account's been locked or they've tried excessive attempts. It means they've tried too many times within a certain period of time frame. Um, so maybe their account has been locked and they're not allowed to continue. There's the general use case. You can also take these ex exceptions and extend them and represent them yourselves when, if and when you need to implement a realm, which we'll talk about later. So that's it. If, it, if this method does not throw an exception, the user is authenticated, and uh, they can go on about using the application. So how does this work? <clears throat> you know, that seemed pretty simple. Um, when you call login on the subject, this is actually a very thin uh, flyweight proxy that delegates to Shiro's security manager under the hood. And the security manager is kind of a behind the scenes component in Shiro. It's really, you only mess with it when you set up an application, when you configure it to run within your app. And after that, it's, it's more or less behind the scenes, just kind of hanging out. But it is responsible for all security operations across all subjects. And so it, it's basically sitting there waiting for these delegated method calls to come in and so they're forwarded to the security manager, and then the security manager internally talks to an authenticator. And this is a specialized component that deals only with authentication. As you'll see later, for authorization, the security manager might delegate to an authorizer, or it might delegate to a session manager. Um, but the idea is that in, for authentication operations, it just delegates to an authenticator that in turn has the ability to communicate, or interact with rather, one or more realms. And again, what we said a realm is just a, an abstraction between a data store or a data source. So maybe the first realm is a text-based realm where usernames and passwords are stored in encrypted NBF format inside of a file. Maybe another one's a relational database or another one's a Cassandra data store or uh, LDAP. <clears throat> the idea is that all of these realms could be interacted with via the authenticator during a login attempt in order to acquire identity information to look that up and then perform the authentication uh, check. The way it interacts with these 
is done via an authentication strategy. And this is a component that represents the strategy design pattern where you can plug in different algorithms based on your needs. So for example, there is uh, one algorithm or one implementation uh, that, that most people use called the first successful authentication strategy. Meaning this strategy will interact with a collection of realms on behalf of the authenticator. And the first realm that authenticates successfully, the very first time you get a successful lookup um, and the user authenticates successfully, no other realm is consulted thereafter. Um, there's other strategies like, you know, all successful, meaning maybe you have to interact with all of them in order for it to be considered a successful authentication attempt. Or at least one, meaning it will try all of them, but as long as at least one of them succeeds, then the authentication attempt is successful. So this allows you to create pretty robust um, algorithms to determine how exactly an authentication attempt should occur inside of your application. Most people find the out-of-the-box strategies more than suitable, but um, you can kind of do some, some neat little customization in here for special use cases. And so when a realm is consulted, it looks up the identity information and the credentials, and the realm implementation has what's called, I, I don't represent it on the slide, but a realm has internally a component called a credentials matcher. And so it knows how to match or perform a comparison, rather, against what the end user was submitted in the token versus what was in the identity store. And so for like hashed passwords, the credentials matcher will hash the incoming password, compare it to the hashed value in the data store, and if they're equal, they can, it, you know, that user can be considered authenticated. Um, there's other credentials comparisons mechanisms as well, maybe public key cryptography. There's other ways um, that a realm can support matching just by plugging in a credentials matcher implementation. That is really all there is to it with the component stuff for authentication. Any questions about this before we move on to authorization? We'll get to some config examples later so you guys can see how, how this stuff is configured inside of an application. But I just wanted to get the concepts on board first. No questions? OK. OK, so those are the internals of how authentication flows work within, within the Shiro. Now we're going to do kind of the same thing for authorization. Um, authorization is defined as the process of determining who can do what. It's basically access control. Can user with identity X perform action Y? Are they allowed to do that behavior? Um, and there's different systems represent kind of this behavior in different ways. Uh, most people are familiar with role-based access control, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But in Shiro, we kind of boil this down into um, a, a couple components. There's permissions, there's roles, and there's users. Users, again, being subjects. Um, and permissions are one of the strongest reasons of adoption for Shiro. Um, the way Shiro handles permissions and, and access control lists, if you will, um, is very, very simple and pretty intuitive. And we find that w w one of the biggest reasons people adopt Shiro is because of how simple they make this uh, for application security checks. And so we'll, we'll show the examples of that in just a second. So permission to us is an atomic security element. It is a, a description or a representation that describes a resource type and a behavior being performed on a resource type. So it's really a, an explicit representation of an action or a behavior. Can I open a door? Can I delete document with ID 1, 2, 3, 4, 5? Right? These are all behaviors taking on, take, being taken upon specific resources or resource types. They fundamentally define what is happening, what is occurring, what action is being taken. They have no relation whatsoever to who is performing these actions. And we'll, you know, we'll explain in a little bit how you can make those, those connections between subjects. But the biggest thing is that they're not tightly coupled to subjects. Other people define these as access control lists. Sometimes they're also called rights in various systems. We call them a permission. OK, roles are things that we've all probably seen before. Um, roles can either be an explicit or an implicit construct. Um, most people know roles as their implicit construct in that they're just a name. You know, I have an admin role or a user role 
or project manager role. And if you look at that name in and of itself, it doesn't tell the software anything. Right? It's just a string. You can't inspect it and find out what that role is capable of doing. So we tend to prefer and advocate um, to the Shiro community that you start to think of roles as more of an explicit construct. And that a role is now a named collection of permissions or rights, whatever you wanna, whatever you wanna call them. And that's really, really powerful because it starts to allow behavioral aggregation over roles. So I have an admin role, maybe they have these 10 permissions, and this project manager role has eight, and a user role has five. You can start to pick and choose individual behaviors and associate them to roles, and then once you associate roles to groups or other roles, you start to create this nice kind of permissioning or access control graph that you can have a very, very fine-grained and controlled security experience for your application. Uh, we've talked about users, um, <clears throat> what users can do in the application or what subject can do in the application is entirely defined by their associations with roles and or permissions. Um, Shiro, I should mention, does not mandate or even suggest a particular data model for your data store. So if your application wants to assign permissions directly to, to user accounts, it can. If it wants to assign them only to roles and then roles are then assigned to, to user accounts, and so you have, by transitive association, if I am in a role, therefore I assume these permissions, that's on you, however you define your data model. Um, maybe you use groups, which are collections of accounts that have, are then also assigned roles or permissions. It's entirely up to you however, you, however you want to design your data store. So Shiro doesn't mandate how those things are, how the associations are made, but your realm returns this information in a collection that Shiro can understand. So you can aggregate this in various different, from various different data models, and Shiro sees it all as one collection. So again, authorization subject centric. Most developers, when they're building applications, think about how do I change behavior based on who's currently interacting with the software? Do I change my user view to show this button or not show this button based on who the current user is, who the current requester is? So because that tends to, see, to be the most natural way of thinking about these things, uh, Shiro maintains a subject centric approach, approach for authorization. Um, you can, of course, off the subject, do checks based on permissions or roles. Shiro also has this very powerful out-of-the-box wildcard permission that most people use if, if they use Shiro permissions. And we'll kind of show you some syntax examples of what that looks like. And again, any data model supported, your Realm implementation fundamentally decides how to represent your associations to Shiro um, in the Realm implementation. So how do we authorize with Shiro? There's a few ways. Um, of course, you could do things programmatically via the subject directly. Um, there's annotations in AOP that can be used. So you can have aspect J annotations to assert functionality before a method's executed. Um, and then we have a JSP tag library. And then if we get 1.3 out, it'll probably have a JSF tag library in there also. <clears throat> so that allows you to render or not fragments of an HTML page or JSP page um, based on the security state of the currently executing user, which is really nice. So here are some examples. So the first one is programmatic, right? I just get my current user like I've done before, and then I can do a quick check. You know, if the current user is, it, you know, is an administrator, maybe I show a delete user button. But if they're not, maybe I don't show the button. Maybe I do something else. So this is a very simple standard role-based access control check that you've probably seen in many other different types of frameworks. This is when using the role as an implicit construct. There's nothing special about that string other than the word administrators. <clears throat> we'll talk about um, explicit role check or permissions in, in just a second. Uh, here's a permission check. <clears throat> so in this case, we're constructing an actual permission object and <clears throat> Excuse me. We're stating that um, this permission represents the behavior to delete the J Smith user, right? The user permission is the the class that represents the domain or the type of object being interacted with. the The first argument is the identifier of that resource type, 
And then the string, the second argument is the verb of, of what action is being performed. And so you can check if the current user is permitted to delete the user, then maybe I could show that button. Otherwise, if they don't have that permission, they don't. And the beautiful thing about this approach is that you're still securing your application, but you're not doing it based on direct references to roles. So in your data model, a subject could be assigned to many roles. As long as potentially any one of those roles or groups has that permission, then you can imply that the user is allowed to do this action. So the, the, the nice thing about this is now you can create dynamic roles in your application or dynamic groups. You can add or create them at runtime, right? Whereas before, if you go with this approach, you're hard coding these things into your source code, right? Which can be a problem depending on the complexity of your application. If it's an uber simple app, that's not really a big deal. The reason why it's kind of a little better to code with these kind of checks is that permissions fundamentally represent behavior that your application was programmed to do. I have a resource type called a user. I have an action, a verb called delete. Behaviors on resources tend to change much less frequently, for example, than manipulating groups and roles or adding in new kind of group schemes or role schemes. And so your source code kind of changes a lot less um, if you focus on the behavior as opposed to the mapping construct, i.e. the role. Uh, here's the same check using Shiro's wildcard permission syntax. This is just a, a string that's colon delimited. And so it's the same concept. The first token in that string before the colon is the data type that's being interacted with. The second token is the verb or the action. And the third one is the identifier. <coughs> so you can check. If the current user is permitted to delete the J. Smith user, go ahead and let them delete it. So this is an example of, uh, again, the, the wildcard syntax. The reason why it's called wildcard is that I could, maybe I have five different actions. Maybe I can create, read, update, delete, and maybe administer, who knows, whatever you want, really. If I put the wildcard in any one of those tokens, it, imme it immediately means to Shiro that you have all of those behaviors. So that, that's the, where it gets its name. At, the wildcard character being the asterisk. <coughs> Here's an example of using annotations to perform or enforce authorization. So this basically means um, if you're using annotations in AOP uh, or maybe aspect J, that the current user has to have the teller role in order for this method to be invoked. If they don't have that role, the method will never be invoked. It'll be an, ex an authorization exception will be thrown and, uh, and bubble up to the stack trace. <coughs> Same concept for permissions. Here's a annotation for permission check. And this stuff is actually going to be more robust in later versions of Shiro, whether it's 1.3 or 2.0. Um, we actually had a community user contribute a very nice DSL for performing many security checks within a single string. So it's like an expression language. Like if they're in this role or that role and they don't have this permission, then only allow the method to be invoked. So you can form much more complicated kind of expression strings uh, in upcoming versions of Shiro. Any questions about this authorization? Okay. Moving along, I'm almost halfway through, and that's actually good. Shiro also supports um, and implements a native session ma management functionality. This is kind of where the breadth of Shiro starts to shine. So most other security frameworks, I think Spring Security and some others, Jazz, only focus on authentication authorization. Shiro fully implements full session support and crypto. Um, <clears throat> and that's nice too, because you can do kind of interesting things with this stuff. So I'll kind of go through this relatively quickly. Um, sessions are what you think they are. So if you're using an HTTP servlet request and you get the session, and you can get the last access timestamp and you can set attributes, that's really all a session is for Shiro as well. But there's one big difference. Shiro does not require a servlet container. If you're running in a servlet container or web container, Shiro will piggyback the existing HTTP infrastructure that's there. But if you're not running in that container, you still get a full session experience. So you can have standalone applications, server applications, server infrastructure, command line applications. They can all use sessions if they want or if you want to leverage them, excuse me, as an application developer. There's heterogeneous client access. So that what that means is if I'm using a web browser to access a session and I want to use a standalone or a desktop application to access the same session state, 
I can do that as long as the session ID is shared securely between the two. There's no other framework out there that has that capability that I'm aware of. It's not built into the, the JDK either. Everything in Shiro, um, including session management, is all POJO based, so very dependency injection or inversion control friendly. So it's just a bunch of getters and setters where you can manipulate uh, state to configure it. Of course, you can register event listeners to uh, react to session lifecycle events. Host address retention means that we retain the address from where the session is initiated, and that can be useful in access control policies in like local area network or wide area network environments where you can guarantee uh, an IP address to correlate to a client. It's not very reliable on the public internet because of network address translation, NAT routers and stuff. You can have multiple end users potentially come from the same IP, so it's really only good in LAN and WAN environments. <coughs> Um, touch support is really useful for rich internet applications or Angular JS apps or those kind of things where you don't want the server side to expire. So you can call touch like every five minutes to make sure that this, the session won't expire. Um, and every, everything is transparent. You don't have to recode your applications to use this stuff. Shiro fully implements the servlet API specification so that you don't have to change any of your source code. All of your existing servlet API request response logic, that all still works. Uh, in web environments. And probably one of the, the biggest benefits of this is that you can get container independent clustering. So Shiro, um, through its DAO configuration and whatnot, can talk to distributed or clustered data stores like Cassandra or Redis or Memcache or Hazelcast. And that's really beneficial because once you get that configured, it only takes like 10 lines of configuration in Shiro, your app servers can now point to a clustered data store for session state. So if app, a, app server A dies, app server B can just pick off from where it left off and access the exact same session without losing any information. So that's really, really beneficial and powerful because now all you have to learn is one session clustering mechanism, that's Shiro. You don't have to learn how Jetty does it, which is different than Tomcat, which is different than JBoss. Right? Do it once and then move on. <coughs> so here is how you get access to a session. Off of our current user, we just get the session object, subject.getSession. Just like the servlet API, HTTP servlet request API, this will guarantee a session. So if one does not yet exist at the time this method is called, a new one's created and then returned to the caller. And just like the servlet request API, you can specify a Boolean to determine whether or not if you actually want a session to be created. And here are some other methods that you would expect to see. Again, just like the servlet API, nothing special get set attributes. Very simple to use both in a servlet environment and outside of a servlet environment. Any questions about this stuff before we move on to crypto? Okay. <clears throat> so Shiro supports really nice cryptography stuff out of the box. Um, cryptography in the sense is, you know, we're protecting information from undesired access by um, hiding it or converting it to nonsense or making sure that prying eyes can't interpret the data. And there's kind of two elements of crypto that are widely used, ciphers and hashes. So a cipher is just an, an algorithm, really, that encrypts or transforms data and then untransforms it uh, based on shared or public and pu public private keys. Symmetric cipher <coughs> Is, a, is an algorithm that does this conversion and then unconversion using the same key or trivially similar key. So block ciphers, stream ciphers, uh, AES is a block cipher, um, Blowfish is a block cipher. These algorithms use the same key to both encrypt and decrypt. An asymmetric cipher uses d different keys. So RSA, public private key crypto, stuff that's used for TLS or SSL, that's all asymmetric ciphers. A hash is a one-way or irreversible conversion of an input source. Um, this is also known as a message digest in, uh, in crypto circles. And these are really useful for credentials verification and comparison, checksums, like MD5 checksums for files to make sure files haven't been tampered with. And Shiro can hash anything with an underlying byte array. And um, you'll soon see how much simpler it is to do it via Shiro than it is to do it with the JDK. So here are some, again, as with everything else, interface-driven, POJO-based. One of the things that drove me crazy with the JCE architecture 
is that you used a static factory method and you passed in what's known as a transformation string into the JCE with all these like slash delimited kind of variables and none of this was type safe. You got back a single instance, it was stateful and so you had to manage the state, you had to catch all sorts of exceptions and if you didn't, if you weren't a person who understood cryptography that well, this was very daunting stuff and it was very difficult to get right. And so Shiro kind of simplifies a lot of this by creating a nice OO um, API with Java Beans compatible getters and setters for configuration. And, it, and most importantly, it comes with very sane out of the box defaults that a lot of crypto systems do not come with. Uh, and we'll, I'll show you an example of, of that in just a minute. Oh, I should also note that the stuff Shiro does is a simplified wrapper over the JCE. So Shiro does not implement from scratch the Blowfish algorithm or the, the, the RSA public-private key algorithms. So by sitting on top of the JCE, Shiro works with all the things that are built into the JCE as well as things, plugins like Bouncy Castle. So because we're not reinventing the wheel, we're just making it a lot easier to use. Um, it's much simpler to use in your apps. And again, it, it, it represents things as nice objects with hierarchies, unlike the JCE. <coughs> so there's a OO hierarchy, there's a JCA cipher service, an abstract symmetric cipher service, default blocker cipher service, right? These things are easy to instantiate. You just instantiate a class. Again, there's no transformation string. So all I'd have to do to do AES encryption is I would just instantiate new AES cipher service. Mind-blowing concept, unbelievable. I don't know why they didn't make it that easy in the JCE, but that's all you have to do for Shiro. Um, and it definitely has more default settings. This is what I alluded to earlier. Um, we use initialization vectors out of the box. How many people here know what an initialization vector is? Or rather, how many people do not know what an initialization vector is for, for ciphers? Okay, so there's, there's a decent amount. So block ciphers specifically operate on fixed sizes or well-known sizes for the algorithm. So AES, for example, has three block ciphers, 128 bits, uh, 192 bits, and 256 bits. And the blocks of data that are churned on or encrypted are always based on fixed, fixed sizes. But if you don't use an initialization vector, like an initial seed, secure random seed, there are patterns that can form in the encrypted output. So the initialization vector, if it's secure random, kind of kicks off the process with this random bits that influence the bits behind it. So everything that comes after is perceived as random as well. If you don't set an initialization vector on a cipher, it's almost not secure at all to crypt analysts. So even if you think you're using AES 256-bit, if you're not using initialization vectors, you're opening yourself up to attack vectors. Most people don't know this about crypto. Here's a really good example. So we have this nice image, it's plain text. Um, plain text being the raw data that we're gonna encrypt. And if I used the, the, the JDK encryption out of the box, if I followed the tutorial and I got the cipher and I didn't know anything about it, initialization vectors, and I just encrypted it, they use an encryption mode of operation called ECB, electronic cookbook. Um, and the reason why is ECB as an algorithm does not or as, an, as a mode of operation, does not require initialization vectors. So it's easier to use. You can just get encryption data right away without having to set up this infrastructure for random data. So if I encrypted it with JDK defaults, this is what I get. Which is pretty stunning if you, look, if you think about it. Like, I wonder how many software applications out there built on top of the, the JCE don't know about these things. You know, if you're, unless you're a cryptography expert, or kind of in, in, embedded with this stuff, most people don't know about these things. So there's a lot of potential gaps and holes in security in existing, infra or existing software because they're unaware of these kind of gotchas. So that being said, Shiro knows about these things and we bake these into the encryption stuff out of the box. So if you just instantiate Shiro's AES cipher service and you call a cipher service dot encrypt, that is what you would get instead, which is exactly what you would want. So credit card data, things like that, are secure with Shiro's algorithm defaults, whereas they're not secure with the, with the, uh, the JDK's defaults. Here is the Cypher Service API. It's very simple. It just has encryption operations. You can encrypt either byte arrays or input streams. You can decrypt 
uh, byte arrays or, or output streams, or no, in, in, input streams. So the idea is, you know, maybe it's a video file or a video stream or audio stream, who knows, you can, you can encrypt them via streams um, or just raw byte arrays. Very easy to use, it's also stateless. So when you invoke one of these methods, when the method returns, everything's encrypted. You don't have to worry about state. The JCE requires you to manage state yourself with their Cypher concept. So the Cypher service handles that automatically. Hashing, default hash impl implementations exist in Shiro for MD5, SHA-1, SHA-256. Until JDK-8, there was no base64 decoder available in the, in the, in the public API for, for Java. Blows my mind how, how decades went by before they got that in, inside of the JDK. Shiro has had this for a while now. So there's built-in hex and base64 conversion for hash output, and there's built-in salt or built in support for salts and repeated hashing, multi like complexity factors, multiple iterations. Here's the, uh, the hash interface. The get bytes returns the raw digest, and you can actually call 2 hex or 2 base64. So how many people here have worked with a message digest class? Message digest class? Or you remember how like you have, to, you have to init the message digest, and then you have to churn on some bytes, and then you have to catch exceptions and all the other crap? This is what it looks like in Shiro by comparison. So if I wanted to hash a string or a file or SHA-512 something with a salt with 1024 iterations and then get base64 output, this is, this is clearly a lot easier to use and understand. You don't have to worry about any, any uh, exceptions and, or anything like that. <clears throat> Talk about some web support. So you can embed Shiro in a web application really easily. Uh, you have to define some um, Shiro filter definitions inside of web.xml. Um, and Shiro, the Shiro filter will protect all requests that go through the system. It will inspect and filter every single request to make sure that you know, the requester is allowed to do something or they're authenticated or what have you. And you can specify all these access control rules in Shiro's configuration. And of course, I mentioned there's JSP tag library support, transparent HTTP session support. This is how you could set it up in web.xml. This is, unfortunately, this is a little out of date, but you can, we also have a, an environment context listener that will start up a Shiro environment and bind it to the servlet context. That's kind of an implementation detail. The, the real point of the slide is that it's very trivial to enable Shiro inside of a web app. You define the filter, you define the mapping to, fil to catch everything, slash star, to make sure that everything can be uh, read and inspected by Shiro before letting the, the web app to uh, process things. So he here's kind of a very simple um, example. Out of the box, Shiro comes with default INI-based configuration. And as you can kind of see in the main section, um, we sort of have what I call poor man's dependency injection. Right? We're, we're doing kind of object graph traversal and setting properties and using, you know, dollar sign notation to indicate attributes or variables that were defined previously. If you're using Spring or Juice or, you know, these other kind of inversion of control or dependency injection frameworks, definitely use those. Those are more powerful, more flexible. But this is pretty nice to get off the ground and, and running, and, it, and it's the lowest common denominator solution. So here's an example of us creating an LDAP realm to interface with an LDAP data store. Um, and we're configuring that realm specifically on the security manager. And we're configuring some URLs, some filter chains, um, to process or enforce kind of behavior for those given paths. So for slash images, we have an anonymous filter that says you don't have to be authenticated or authorized. Anyone's allowed to access those URLs. Um, what's this one? Account slash, oh, authc means if I go to the uh, any account URL or sub URL underneath that, I have to be authenticated first. The user has to prove their identity. Um, or you can just use basic authentication instead of like form-based authentication. Um, or maybe in order to invoke the remoting endpoint, I have to have both, I have to be both authenticated and I also have to have the B2B client role in order to invoke that endpoint. And so what you see here is a much simpler way of defining filter chains than you would otherwise in XML. Um, in the web.xml file. The request flows through from the starting point down to the ending point, and it has to uh, pass all of these various filters 
And if it does, then it's authorized to continue onto the web application. So this gives you a really nice separation of security concerns that you don't have to invade your application with. They can stay in here and you can manipulate them as necessary. JSP tag lib authorization. Here is an example of controlling web page output based on uh, your roles. So if I have this role, if I have the admin role, I'll see that, that link. If I don't have the admin role, you know, maybe I'll see that text message. And so th in the same spirit of this one, there's also many other tag libraries that you can use to control page output. You know, are, do they have a permission? Do they have any roles? Are they a guest or are they a user? Are they authenticated? Are they remembered? These are all accessible via outputs or via tag libs. And just briefly, I'll wrap up. We have auxiliary features. So there are things like threading and concurrency. So Shiro has executor service implementations that will wrap the current runnable or callable with something that retains the subject identity across threads. So if I'm on one thread and then I dispatch some work to an executor, that executor is on a different thread. And Shiro uses thread locals often to retain subject identity during requests. And so if I spawn some behavior that's on a separate thread, clearly my identity is lost. But if you use one of Shiro's executor services to wrap another one, that identity is retained automatically. So Shiro will bind the subject to the thread, and after the callable or runnable, it'll automatically remove the subject from the thread. So you don't have to manage any of that stuff. You can have async, multi-threaded applications, and identity will, will follow the threads. So you can always guarantee that you have a user associated with that chunk of work being executed. Uh, there's run as support, so I can assume the identity of another user. Maybe I am logged in and as an admin, and I want to assume the identity of some other user, so I can, I can assimilate their identity to perform behavior as them. That's kind of useful in a lot of web apps. You can create subject instances in an ad hoc fashion using a builder. So you don't, usually Shiro creates them for you, but if, you're, if you don't have a servlet filter to do that automatically, you might want to create these instances yourself and then bind them to the thread or use them in a framework that you might be building to, to add in identity support. We have some out-of-the-box unit test case, test case objects, classes that you can extend from to simulate um, thread local behavior. So you don't have to, when you set up your test harnesses, you don't have to worry about thread binding and unbinding. And Shiro also has this notion of remembered versus authenticated. This is really important in our world. Um, there, there are frameworks out there that have remember me count as authentication. And what's interesting about that is that's, that's actually, it's an invalid way to think about things. Um, and I'll give you an example. Let's say you're using uh, Amazon.com and you, you go and you put something, you, you log in, you give your username and password, and then you add something to your shopping cart. And then you're called off to a meeting or whatever, and or you go home at the end of the day and you don't log out. Right? When you come back the next day, your session's expired, it's gone. But Amazon still kind of customizes their web page for you. They're like, oh, hi, Les, here's your recommendations for books or whatever. Right? They probably know who you are because there's, an, there's a remember me cookie on the browser that they're, that they're implicitly trusting that probably represents you. But if you try to access credit card data or whatever, they force you to authenticate because that's really secure information. So Shiro actually maintains two different states. You can either be authenticated, meaning you have proven your identity during your current session, or you could be remembered, which means you haven't proven your identity, but we probably know who you are. And so you can customize your user experience, show login screens, assert that they're authenticated before they hit the credit card page or what have you, using these various methods. Now, you, don't, you can choose not to use them. Um, there's, there's this notion of, if they're a user, meaning they're authenticated or they're remembered, in either case they're considered a user of the app, maybe that's good enough for your use cases, but Shiro fundamentally retains this state so you can make the proper security decisions. <clears throat> really important, for, especially for remember me web apps. Logging out, super easy. I just get the subject and I call the logout method. That will remove any identity associated with the subject. It will also terminate the session associated with that subject and and release all kind of current state. And we sometimes get questions, how do I react to this scenario? You can do whatever you want in your application logic either before or after this call, but you can also listen to authentication events um, via Shiro's event mechanism. So you can listen for an authentication or a stop session event 
and then do whatever you need to that way. Just some wrap up. Um, in 1.3, we've got sort of a type safe event bus coming out um, that simplifies the event infrastructure. Um, we'll have out of the box Hazelcast session clustering. Right now, I think we kind of defer to EH cache, but because it's LGPL'd, we can't legally extend it due to the, the Apache license. We can integrate with it, but we can't like customize it due to the um, copyleft license. So Hazelcast being Apache license is perfectly suited for this for us. Um, we'll have much stronger JEE support and um, kind of uh, JSF tag libs and whatnot. We'll have more default Realm implementations. So right now when you build a Realm, you kind of have to do some account lookup, some authorization checks. We're going to provide even more default behavior out of the box for the 8020 use case, and then you'll just have to tweak configuration settings. And we're trying to clean up our authentication filter. So when you see an authentication filter in Shiro today, it usually handles one particular authentication use case, either basic or digest or OAuth 1.0a or what have you. Um, we're going to have an authentication filter that will support many different authentication schemes. So you can just plug in schemes into the one filter, and if any of them are used to authenticate, it will just work. <coughs> That's it. Um, we're, you know, give Stormpath a try. We're still a startup. We're looking for feedback. Um, if you have any questions about this presentation or Shiro or anything else in general, please just feel free to reach out to me, Twitter, what have you. But thanks for your time. I'm available for questions if you have them. Yes. SSO? Yes. What kind of SSO? Because uh, there are many kinds of SSO. <laughs> yeah, I think we'll search about it. How does, uh, is there any support for it to repo your Dora app to the server and also where the logic is going to Yeah. And also have an SSO version. Yeah, so um, in, in probably an upcoming version of Shiro, hopefully maybe in two, would we'll definitely want to support SAML consumer kind of workloads. So your web app can participate in single sign-on flows and redirect to an identity provider, have the login, and then redirect back. Um, of course, given what I do at Stormpath, we're going to have that out of the box at Stormpath. So Stormpath can be an identity provider that also links to other identity providers. So you could have a Shiro-based web app redirect authentication to, to Stormpath, username and password hit enter, redirect back to your app, and you probably won't have to code anything uh, because both the consumer and the provider will be implemented out of the box. Um, implementing a SAML consumer because of how you retain state in sessions and other things, or excuse me, a SAML provider, identity provider, because of how state is maintained is a lot more difficult, and that may or may not make it into the next version, but SAML consumer, no doubt, that'll be very easy. Um, OAuth 1.0a2 and, and, and OAuth 2 will probably be there as well. Um, I do want to mention, though, that OAuth is not a single sign-on protocol. A lot of people don't really think of it, or they think of it as social login or single sign-on, but it's not. It's really... It's an authorization protocol. It's, does application A have the authorization access control rights to read an account in Facebook or read an account in Google? There's no guarantee of authentication in that process. So um, SS, SSO is really best achieved by SAML. Accessing accounts and third-party services is better achieved by OAuth. However, with OAuth 2 and their integration with OpenID Connect, that will be a valid authentication protocol. So we'll, we'll probably support that too. No, there's, there's definitely some stuff, I think, in one of our feature branches um, that we've been messing around with, but it's not, it's not fully solidified yet. Um, to uh, just be completely on honest and open, um, we're putting the IDP stuff in, in Stormpath now, and I wanted that to work so I could then write the SAML client to work against it for Shiro, because that means I would have a fully functional IDP that I could test against for anything, including Shiro. So, so we're about to roll that out, and then we'll throw in, I'll, I will probably add in the SAML consumer stuff right, right after that's done. So hopefully in 1.3 or Shiro 2, we'll be able to get that out. Any other questions? Okay, thanks for your time, guys. Talk to you later.